everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Society for Experimental Biology Christmas Lectures 2022. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with SEB, we're a society for soci scientists who research animal, cell and plant biology. My name's Jen, I'm one of the Society's events officers. Uh, today we're assisting us, we also have other SEB staff members, Anna, Rebecca, Enyola and Ben. Uh, before we start with the speaker introduction, I just want to remind you of a few technical details. So as you might have noticed, this session is being recorded, so please keep your camera off if you don't want to appear in the recording. Please also keep your microphones off during the presentation. The lecture will be around 30 minutes long and will be followed by a question and answer session. You can type your questions in the chat box and we'll go through them at the end or if you prefer, you can raise your hand during the Q&A session and I'll call upon your name so you can switch on your microphone to ask the question yourself. Uh, so without further ado, we're delighted to welcome to you the second lecture of our series entitled Spying on Whales and Walrus from Space to Safeguard Their Future, which is brought to us by Dr. Hannah Kubain. Hannah is a research associate at the British Antarctic Survey She's particularly interested to develop the use of very high resolution satellite Im imagery and other space sensors to monitor marine mammals in remote regions and to make these methods apl applicable at a global oceanic scale by improving the efficiency of image an analysis through crowdsourcing and automated systems. She currently focuses on whales and walrus. So thank you very much for accepting this invitation, Dr. Hannah. And I'm handing over to you now. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much first to yeah, Jennifer and Anna for inviting me into the Society for Experimental Biology to give me the opportunity to tell you a bit about whales and walrus, two of the species I get to uh, work on every day. It's quite fun. So yeah, a bit of the work we do here at the British Antarctic Survey, there's a team of us that do wildlife from space. So I do whales and walrus, but I have colleagues doing penguins, albatross, and seals. So here's, here's a new interesting platform that can certainly give us an insight in places we used to not be able to get data from, or, or not as often as we wished we could get it. So first, I'd say let's dive into the world of whales. So Whales from Space, um, that was a project I first joined back in 2016 um, when I was doing my PhD and I still work a bit on it today so I thought I'd give you a bit of an overview of what we've done. So first, kind of why whales? Um, so whales, yes, people do find that majestic and they're gorgeous animals and we do love to go whale watching and spend time with them. But in terms of the marine ecosystem, they are really important because they are what we consider marine ecosystem engineers. And there are different ways in how they're like this little engineer in their own ecosystem. The first one I want to mention is what we call the whale pump. So that's uh, the fact that whale will go and eat at depth, but they can't poop when they're at depth. So they'll come back to the surface and poop at the surface and then give all these nutrients that the phytoplankton needs to, to bloom and then everything follows from the zooplankton feeding on the phytoplankton. And so that is one of the big ones because um, it's that redistribution of nutrients. Another way that whales do give food to the marine ecosystem is by being prey. So mostly, uh, mostly killer whales. Another one is sediment suspension. So on this image, you can see um, a gray whale that's feeding in shallow waters and they like to feed at the bottom. But when they do that, they bring a lot of sediment in suspension. And in the sediments, you have organ nutrients that are brought to the surface where you have lights and where phytoplankton can, can grow. And the last one I wanted to approach are what we call the whale fall. So when whales are gonna die, they can either strand on our shores or they're gonna sink to the bottom of the ocean and that's going to bring food to parts of the ocean where there isn't much uh, food available so suddenly it's a bit of a food frenzy for whatever animals live down there so whales are important and when they were in high numbers they were more well full they 
the whale pump was bigger, there were more of them as prey, but whales number dramatically decreased. That was due to commercial whaling, which started around the 11th century. That was with the Basque countries like France and Spain. And then he kept going until the 20th century. But I wanted to show you with the example of the southern right whales. They were about 100 to 60,000 individuals early as in the yeah, 18th century. But then towards suddenly they got hunted because heavily because the right whale were the right whale to hunt and they were quite slow they would float at the surface so they were easy to target and what happened is as soon as right whales or southern right whales would be decimated in one area they would go to another area and and so forth and that meant that there wasn't much left and then they would move to another species and so like what this graph you see kind of repeated for other species just delayed in time. But in 1986, that's when the International Willing Commission decided to have a complete moratorium, so like a ban on commercial whaling for all whales. Because before there had been some bans on certain species like the right whales, because we knew the numbers were quite low. So since then, we want to know um, if whales number are coming back up, because we know they're quite important for the ecosystem. And the thing is, yes, commercial whaling stopped, um, but there is still, there are new threats that have now appeared. And two of the main ones are collision with ship strikes. That, that's quite big, especially from where I grew up uh, in southern France in the Mediterranean, because we have a lot of big shipping lane. Ship strike is a big problem for whales in this area. And there's also entanglement in fishing here. That's the other big one. So especially for the North Atlantic right whale, which we know are suffering quite heavily from being entangled in lobster pots, but also from the collision with lobster. So these are two of the new threats they face. There is also chemical and noise pollution and other ones. So there is a lot of various scientists that are trying to understand how whales are faring in this world. And there are different ways we can do this. So the, the first, one of the, be the biggest, <laughs> the main platform used or from a boat. So you're going to have researchers on a boat and observing uh, the ocean and just counting, uh, reporting whenever they encounter whale, the species and so on. But from a boat, you can also deploy these kind of cables that have hydrophones and do acoustic survey. Then planes are quite heavily used as well. Um, the thing with plane is that it is a bit dangerous for humans um, because you have to fly quite low. So it is quite handy. It does give us a good overview of the whole area, but there are some dangers associated to it. Uh, Land-based, so that can happen when whales are migrating near the coast, uh, such as in California and in Australia, but it can't be applied everywhere and you would need to be next to where humans tend to live or it has to be easily reachable. You also have fixed uh, platforms, so use these would usually have um, hydrophones on them. It's acoustic and listening for what species are around and what they're doing. And the newest kind of latest one are UAVs, so the unoccupied um, aerial vehicles. And these have kind of revolutionized the whale science. We're allowed to get a lot more data about certain whales health and uh, information you couldn't get otherwise. So that has been a very uh, welcomed addition to, to the toolbox. But here, what I do is like, I'm proposing kind of with my colleagues, a new, a new tool to that toolbox. And these are what we call the VHR satellites. So they are the very high resolution satellites. And by very high resolution, we mean that it can capture images with a special resolution of 30 to 50 centimeters. So quite, quite, quite detailed. If you think of whales being 18 meters for a right whale or 27 meters or 30 meters for blue whales. So you would think you could detect them. And there have been studies before we jumped into this in my, my Atherish and Tonic survey that proved that you could do it. So we're deciding to focus on this VHR satellite as a new tool because 
there are several of them that orbit around our planet. And the thing is they can capture images of anywhere on the planet. And this is very new for us because we can't go by boat everywhere. We can't go by plane everywhere. Logistically, it's quite difficult and it can be quite expensive to organize boats and plane surveys. And, and with planes, as I was saying, there's the danger to human lives as well. And although drones can then potentially go anywhere, you still need to be fairly close to it when you fly. It can never be out of sight uh, for most of them. So satellite is offering us that opportunity to get a snapshot of what's happening in places where we can't we can't go we can't go as often as we wish for like for various reasons. Um, so. I wanted to show you now some of those cool images we have of the various species uh, we've looked at from space. And the first one I want to show is of southern right whales. <laughs> Let's stick to the southern right whales, but that's because that's the first species um, Peter Fretwell, who's leading our research group, has studied from space. So we then studied them in a few different places. Because they stay at the surface, we know we're likely to see them on the satellite images. So that's also why we chose them. And on the bottom right of the two circles, the one on the right, you can see the it's a black body with a white dot. And this is telling us that it's a, it's a right whale. So that was quite exciting to see it. But the image to the left was a big, um, oh my God moment between uh, Peter and I, because we didn't think we could see them that well. At that point, we had never seen an image of a whale from space that where you could see the fluke. So that is, yeah, I put that image there because it's one of our favorites. Because you can see, you have no doubt about what you, you're looking at. Uh, compared to other one, it could just be a blob. So it could be, could be a wave, could be a boat. We've also looked at fin whales. So these species to me is partly interesting because it's uh, the first whale I ever saw because I grew up uh, near the Med in, in France. So I was quite pleased that we got to get some imagery to study them. And again, here it was quite impressive. You can see the fruit, but you can even see their, their flippers. So suddenly you see all these details that tells you, yes, what I'm seeing is a whale, I'm 100% sure. And in the Pelagos, we've tried to do some surveys with collaborators uh, from Italy about reducing ship strikes because it is one of the biggest threat to that species um, in this area. Um, so there's, we're doing more work to see how we can uh, help find ways to reduce ship strikes by bringing more data about whale, how whales use the, the space. Another species we looked at are humpback whales. So most people, when we go whale watching, that's one of the species we tend to see. Uh, they're quite acrobatic and uh, fun to watch. But weirdly, in satellite images, they were uh, not the easiest one uh, to look at. The first image we had was from Hawaii, and they were quite splashy. It's their breeding ground, so they were quite demonstrative. And a lot of the things I would see were splash and not uh, the nice well body like I showed earlier. So the image on the bottom left, it, I do realize it's not really clear, but that was one of the best images we had, um, where you kind of see two whales swimming side by side, and behind them, you have those white circles that are like their fluke prints. And then another thing that was really cool to see, and that tells us it's a hundred percent sure uh, humpback whale, was of the Western Antarctic Peninsula. This kind of spiral, that's what we call a bubble net, uh, because humpback whales, when they feed, they'll tend to create those, this like spiral of bubbles and trap the, their food in the middle. So that was um, another good snapshot we were glad to capture. We also looked at great whales. These have been really good uh, to study, especially in those lagoons in Mexico when, where they come to calves because it's very calm seas and you can they're at the surface, you can see them clearly, there's not too much wind. And here again, uh, I was really impressed that I could see the fluke. Those, that was another one of my favorite images. And the last one I wanted to show were belugas. So we've been able to also detect smaller species from space. Um, other groups have, have proved it too. And I wanted to show you that image because you can even see the little stump behind, that's their fluke. And I didn't think it would be possible. 
first I didn't even think we could see them and then yes we are able to and they don't look just like a grain of rice you can actually see the stump and be sure of it and you might notice that some of them might look a bit more gray than white and those would be the younger ones so there is um things that can be done and especially with species like with the belugas that live in such remote area like the arctic it can be a very valuable tool to understand uh, where they are how many they are so we're trying to do a lot of work of like um, what species we can see how we can differentiate but one thing that we need is to automatically find whales in the imagery because the imageries are quite big and to scan them all manually although it's quite fun to play where's wally it's um, it's quite time consuming and for conservation you do want to get an answer as quickly as possible so what we're working on right now is basically yeah giving your image to a computer and have we're, we're working on different algorithm which one would work best to tell us these are the whales and these are boats um and like any other confounding features because we found that sometimes it's easier to find the confounding features than actually find the whales so we can eliminate everything and then know what's left but to do this um you need a lot of examples of what whales look like in satellite imagery and that's one thing that at the British Antarctic Survey we developed, we have a big library of these sort of images to help us train this uh, artificial intelligence like algorithm. So that was about whales. Um, I hope you enjoyed the little pictures. Now we're going to move to another marine mammal, but this time the, the walrus. So at the moment, I tend to do most of my work on, on walrus. And this image is... From this summer of Svalbard, uh, we got to go and do some field work because we wanted to validate our satellite data with uh, UAV drone data. So I wanted to put yeah, this, this lovely image of all of them cuddling on the beach with a few in the water. So the War is from Space project, that's a project in partnership between the WWF and the British Antarctic Survey. And it's over five years. So what we're hoping to do is using satellite images and the power of the crowd to help us go through all of the imagery we're collecting to better understand how the population trend of walrus and how walrus are faring in their changing environment. Because we know they rely on sea ice and we know sea ice isn't doing too good in the Arctic. So first I'd like to show you a bit about where walrus are found. So walrus are found across the whole of the Arctic. I mean, sometimes we know they're gonna come and, and visit um, England. And at the moment there is, I believe Thor is still around UK shores or might have left. And that does happen. You do have what we call vagrant that will sometimes uh, come further south, but they tend to stay in the Arctic. And they're split in, two recognized species. Here there is a third one, but if I start first with the Atlantic water, so that's one of those recognized species and they're found from Canada to Russia. And then we have the Pacific water, so that's the other recognized species uh, between Alaska and Russia. And then the Laptev water that's in between is believed to belong to the Pacific water, but it's still debated because the reason we think it belongs to the Pacific walrus was based on um, a few DNA samples. So more study can be done on this to figure out where the Laptev sea belong and whether they should be a separate species like it had been in the past. Before our walrus from space project, we're only focusing on getting imagery for the Atlantic walrus and the Laptev walrus. Because there is more yeah, movement uh, in the Pacific. So we thought we'll start with this. <laughs> It's big enough already and then well we'll see there are plenty of people that are on the pacific that could do this <laughs> so warriors do like to what we say haul out on ice so they will use yeah their tusks to like get their body on on these ice flows and that's where they like to go to rest in between foraging if they want to mate and breed so it's quite vital for them to have access to sea ice. But in the summer when it melts, they will sometimes go on land. Uh, it is known that they do go on land. And those places they haul out on land tend to be the one used to count them because they will go, they'll tend to go back to the same places on land. Whereas on ice will be a big area you have to search and you wouldn't know where to get an imagery from. 
But as I'm just saying, uh, sea ice isn't doing too good in the Arctic. It's reducing quite fast. And last year we thought it was reducing three times the, uh, the global average, but now I believe it's moved to five or seven times. So walrus habitat is changing and we need to know what that's going to mean for, for their future. Are they going to be able to cope? Will they be able to find their food? Because we know that when they're on ice flows, it's easier for them. They're closer to all to their food. So walrus love to feed on clam. And suddenly, if they can't find all these, um, these grounds where you have lots of clams and they have to travel further because they had to come and rest on land, it might mean, yes, they waste more energy. So it, we need to know, yeah, what's going to happen. And one way we're hoping to do this with that project is looking at numbers of worries that comes on land. Uh, because as I was saying, yeah, it's where they tend to come back in the summer when the ice melts. And we've been using three different satellites. So all of these are VHR. And we thought, yeah, well, let's get as many <laughs> as we can to make sure we can cover the whole of the Atlantic and uh, Laptop branch. So we've teamed up with, uh, so that's Maxar Technologies that operates these three satellites. There are more of them that could do 50 centimeters, but it's different companies. So we're teaming up with Maxar, we've given them this map where all of brown dot are where uh, warriors have been reported to come and haul out on land. So that map was made yet gathering a lot of various data from various literature, from indigenous literature to scientists to any local expert. Because any information of, yeah, walrus have been seen holding out there is um, important to us because we want to make sure we get images. So some of these points are, are considered abandoned holdouts, but we're still interested to know if walrus are coming back there or not. Um, because it's not that it's that easy to Go to all these places every year or every five years by boat or plane so even though they're considered abandoned maybe they're not anymore and this is one of those gorgeous images we captured that's an island of russia and on the southern yeah, beach of it you can see this brown uh, brown blob and these are warriors and if we zoom in you can actually it is a bit blurry but you can see each individual Warriors. And this is the power of using VHR satellites. It's 30, 50 centimeter resolution, and warriors being about three, four meters long for adults. You suddenly realize, okay, we can we can detect them and we can try and count them. It doesn't necessarily have to be putting a point on it. It could just be drawing an outline around it and then extrapolating using density estimates that we know. Um, because it is kind of what they do from uh, the big UAV survey using the drone survey because sometimes warriors can form very large group and really tiny groups so even trying to count on on a drone image that's really detailed I think it's about two centimeters resolution it's still tricky but really pleased um, we can find warriors from space initially wasn't too sure so that's the first success from the project but as if you remember the map from before there are quite a lot of points where we got imagery for and that's, um, that would take a lot of time for one or two people <laughs> to go through and figure out whether they're warriors or not. So we thought some scientists had used crowdsourcing. So asking anyone from the public to help them figure out whether they were, for them it was weddle seals and whether to count. So we've tried to do the same for warriors. So in 2021, last October, last year in October, we launched our first crowdsourcing campaign, and that was what we called phase one, so only searching. So it would be reviewing imagery and saying whether you would see walrus or not. And we're now preparing phase two, which will involve uh, counting walrus in the images that were found to have walrus. And so we collected imagery in summer 2020. We collected some in 2021 and summer 2022. So yeah, we're gonna try and repeat this campaign, adding all this imagery. And I wanted to show you a bit about, so that phase one, the finding warriors, that's kind of how it looks like if you registered after passing a short training to help you figure out what's a warriors, what's not. Because we found out that in the Arctic, in some places, there are big piles of rusty barrels that can look like warriors. So we thought, okay, we need to give people an idea of 
what to not get tricked by because rocks as well are, can trick your eyes. But that's how it looked. Um, each image chips were cut into so images of 200 by 200 meters. And then you could say whether or not you will see a virus. We also had the option to say poor image because um, also, also we tried to select only the images that were not cloudy and not too dark. Uh, there's still some corners of certain images would have some cloud. So we had the options for poor image. So that was done last year, and that was with the imagery from 2020. And at the moment, uh, we have a, a new campaign live that has the imagery from 2021. But I wanted to show you these because that's what the, the crowd found. Uh, really pleased that it actually worked. So that's a big hole out on rocky shores. Then they were also able to find like the big hole outs on sand. So we thought that this would be the case because when they formed the Thai group, it's easier to spot, but we were really pleased to see that the public could even spot the warriors when they didn't form these tight groups and there wasn't as many of them, even when they were just like three or five of them. So at the moment we're going through all of the data to, to assess how accurate uh, the detection from, from the crowd is and to see if it's a viable solution to, to ask the crowd to help detect virus in images. And one surprise we did have, um, we had some belugas in the imagery that were labeled as warriors. And I am glad people did say yes, warriors to these because I was reviewing all the positive answers and it's like, this is definitely not warriors, but it's a gorgeous image of belugas. So since then for the new campaign, we now have a button to say other wildlife. So in case people see polar bears or anything else they find interesting, we can just say other wildlife unless they are warriors, warriors takes priority. <laughs> and yes, we do have a new campaign now that any of you can take part at the moment. And it's a search campaign like the one I was showing you where you'll be fed to different image chips and say, yes, no worries or other wildlife. And that's the imagery I would collect in 2021. And if you wanna take part in it, the easiest way to register is to go on the WWF uh, UK website. Walrus, if you search Walrus from Space WWF, you'll, uh, you'll end up on it. And then here you have all the links to uh, know a bit more about the project and all the links to register. And so now we are working on the counting phase. So that's the ultimate goal is to count Walrus. So hopefully January 2023, um, that will be available for anyone to take part in. And here we'll be asking people, so each images will have walrus for sure. And we'll ask them to draw either a polygon, like that yellow one we have here, where the walrus are just too tight and it's hard to like pick out individual walrus and put a point on each of them. And also the option to put point like here where you have two walrus that are away from the main group. So that one is the one that I'm actually working it today and it's hopefully gonna be ready very soon. It's very exciting. So thank you very much uh, for coming today and tuning in. And if you'd like to find out uh, any more about it, you can always go on the Wildlife from Space page uh, on the British Antarctic Survey website or go on that WWF uh, page to learn all about the Walrus Project. So yeah, now if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you so much for that, Hannah. That was really interesting. Um, and if I could just draw your attention to the chat, there is a link to our feedback form. So anyone that's attended today, if you've got a spare minute, we'd really appreciate your feedback on this event. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to pop any questions you've got in the chat, or if you'd prefer to raise your hand, then I'm sure Hannah would be happy to answer any questions now. Okay, so we've got a question from Lauren. Exciting to hear that you're using indigenous literature. Is this becoming a more common practice in recreating baselines in Arctic research? For Arctic research, uh, for sure. Um, because yeah, they have such a wide breadth of knowledge that we don't have. They've been there for so long on this coast. So initially in that first date for us, it was only information recorded in paperwork, but with um, with the WWF, uh, they have an Arctic section that helps us to collaborate with indigenous community. So I'm really pleased that it is added to it because even with the whale project, I didn't present it there, but I 
did a bit of work somewhere in Alaska and yeah, you get to learn so much more that, that we don't know because they have those, I don't know how many hundreds of years of knowledge. And they have the eyes on the ground, we don't. Have we got any more questions? We've got one from Carolina. Uh, thanks for the great lecture and work, Hannah. How are you going to match these satellite data with available data on tagged animals, also tracked by satellites? Is that useful? So for walrus, it's going to be useful. But first, I'll say about whales, because I initially we tried to use ta tagged whales to ground truth that whale we saw in imagery, uh, but that was really tricky because the, the tags had an accuracy of a hundred meters or more. So we needed just under five meters. Um, so for whales, it was a bit more tricky, but we've, I have some colleagues who used tagged uh, data from whales to understand how often they are at the surface. So we know how many whales we're missing because in the imagery we look at, it's like our own eyes. If the whales are too deep below the surface, we won't see them. So we were using the, the kind of diving tag data for this. And then for the walrus, tag data is gonna be very important for calibrating the counts because we're counting the walrus that are on land, but a lot of them are in the water. But a lot of research has been done in various places to understand the proportion of walrus on land versus water. And that was using tag data. So we'll be using uh, these one when it comes to calibrate the counts. Thank you for that, Hannah. Um, have we got any more questions? I've got a question actually, to pop that in the chat. <laughs> um, so I know you touched on this in, in regards to the whales, but are you also planning to use artificial intelligence to detect walrus in satellite imagery? So at the moment, yeah, we're just doing crowdsourcing because uh, one thing you need uh, to do automation is a lot of examples of worries in imagery, which now we do. So we could do some automation, but the thing we do like with the crowdsourcing is the outreach. And because we didn't feel like much was known about worries, we can kind of raise um, the plight of worries and all about how they're impacted by climate change. But we do have one colleague here that who's using satellite images but not the very high one the more like 10 meters so you would see all the big group of walrus as little blobs but you would never see the individual walrus and we're using the automation because ultimately it'd be a really good um, good way for us to assess every year where walrus are at least the bigger group um, so yeah there are there are definitely plans to use automation because it's been found to work quite well for other species Oh, amazing, exciting. <laughs> um, we've got another one from Carolina. Uh, I have another one. I have some trouble with this term, ecosystem engineer. Which animal is not an ecosystem engineer? <laughs> I think, yeah, they all are. But it was more, I think we suddenly discovered that whales did give more to the ecosystem uh, than we thought, um, especially the, the whale fall. If we suddenly understood how many less whales we have in the world, we realized that uh, all those whale that used to happen in the deeper part didn't have as much food anymore. So we wonder how much that's impacted. Um, but yeah, no, all, all, uh, all animals from ecosystems or ecosystem engineers ultimately. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we've got another question here from Chiara. To which other species do you think it would be possible to use this type of technology? Could this also be applied to uh, phytoplankton blooms, maybe by combining it with chlorophyll data? Um, yeah, so there are, yes, yeah, satellite data using chlorophyll data. There are group, a uh, researcher group, um, from Strathclyde University in Scotland, I have looked, they're all looking at zooplankton uh, from space. So that's, they can, like when they do the big, I guess like swarm, not bloom, swarm for the zooplankton, uh, these uh, can, they're working on it and can sometimes be detected. Some people here have tried, but it didn't work as well. Then, yeah, we have people in our, our group that do penguins, uh, different species, albatross and seals. Uh, there are a lot of species that have been used for, but yeah, no, phytoplankton, 
it is being used uh, with other yeah you can see the big blooms thank you um and a question here from minster uh just to have an idea of the scope how many images are you collecting over a certain period and does this span all year or just particular times of the year so for the world it was really sporadic it was we wanted to understand if we could see detect different species of whales so we had one image uh, for southern right whales in Peninsula Valdez in Argentina. We had four images in the Med. So it was like very much one or two images here and there uh, for when you need to study. The aim is to then that it could be expanded um, to the wider areas, but we do have issues with white caps and uh, the swell. So various groups are trying to understand how we could still detect whales in these situations and whether we can't. And then uh, that's also a good um, result for us to know what is actually possible with satellites. But with walrus, I wouldn't know the exact number, but it's been easily over 200 images uh, that we are collecting every summer because we collect one image per walrus hole out. It would be better to collect more images during the summer for each hole out but it does cost uh, some money. So we're not able uh, to do that just yet. So that is one thing we are able to do with the 10 meter resol uh, resolution satellite because these continuously take imagery. So that's the Sentinel-2 satellite, for example. And in the Arctic, you will collect one or two image per day. So you have as many as you want. Then clouds is the problem in the Arctic. So you don't always... Uh, doesn't always work. So that's something else we're looking into is right now we're using optical images that can't see through cloud, but we are looking into yeah, the more um, radar images that can detect through clouds because we know it has worked uh, for walrus. Whales, it will be tricky. Yeah, it's just not at sea, but yeah. Um, so thank you all for your questions today and for attending the event.